Good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, you are, my dear. Yes. yes. Good morning, madam. Uh, Good morning. I would like to welcome everybody to a very exciting workshop, a workshop on the basics of neuroradiology for the radiology for the anesthesiologists. And to conduct this workshop, we have a very eminent faculty from the Institute of Neurosciences. And uh, can I have the first slide, please? So the moderators for this session would be Dr. Mona Tiwari, Dr. Nishan Cha, Dr. Orko Bhatsaji, and Dr. Shubhrato Nag. So the first the session, I would request Dr. Mona Tiwari to kindly start the session. Dr. Mona Tiwari is a senior consultant and the head of imaging in the Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. And uh, she, her research interests are imaging in epilepsy and neurodegenerative disorders and pediatric neuroimaging. She has over 15 years of experience and various publications, papers, scientific posters, and invited talks to her credit. So I would request Dr. Mona to kindly start the workshop and to introduce the other speakers. Dr. Mona, please. Are you there, Dr. Mona? Yes, yes, I'm there. So good morning and a very warm welcome to you. We look forward to a very exciting workshop. Hello, good morning. Um, I'll share my screen. Yeah, so we are uh, from the Department of Radiology. Uh, we are very happy to be a part of this SNAC conference. And um, uh, my other colleagues, uh, very young dynamic radiologists, Dr. Arko Bhattacharya and Dr. Nishan Jha, they will be uh, presenting subsequently. They'll be showing the cases of uh, chest imaging. And um, Dr. Subhrat Narag, he'll be dealing with the interventional radiology part. And uh, today I'll be talking about the neuroimaging, the basics of neuroimaging for the anesthesiologists. So I'll start without much ado with the neuroimaging cases. Can you uh, see my screen, right? Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is the first case. Uh, which is a nine-year-old boy uh, who presented with sudden onset right-sided weakness, slurring of speech, repeated vomiting, and then unconsciousness. So here we can see uh, this is axial CT scan of the brain, which is showing a hyperdensity, which is bright, which is hyperdense lesion in the left basal ganglia and thalamic region. So this is actually hemorrhage, this is bleed, and surrounding it, the dark part is the edema. So there is hemorrhage in the left basal ganglia thalamocapsular region, and here you can see the lateral ventricles. So the left lateral ventricle and the right lateral ventricle. And there is hemorrhage inside the ventricles as well. There is intraventricular extension of hemorrhage. On the next slide, we are able to see that this is the third ventricle and you can see the hemorrhage inside the third ventricle. And here, this is the posterior fossa and the fourth ventricle, you can see the bleed. So, but this is just a nine-year-old boy. Normally, if we see some hemorrhage in the basal ganglia, we think of hypertensive hemorrhage or other pathologies. So in this child, we have to think of something else. But sometimes some people get confused that, you know, even this is bright on CT scan and hemorrhage is also bright. So how to differentiate? CT scan basically uses the X-ray. So there is an X-ray tube and a multiple ring of detectors and the signal is detected. And depending on the composition of the tissue, the densities of the tissue, we get different house field values. Those are the attenuation values which we see. So some, sometimes you can see these bright spots in the basal ganglia, but that is calcification. So the attenuation value of calcification will be different from that of hemorrhage. That's how we differentiate. So there is a house field unit, a scale is there where water is assigned a zero unit, air is minus thousand and bone, 
and other high density will be plus thousand and above. So water is zero. So calcification, the, if you measure the household value, the calcification value will be around 150. Whereas for the blood, it will be between 55, 75. So that's why you say that this high density thing is the blood or the hemorrhage. Now, another case here, it's a companion case where you see a huge hematoma. There's a big bleed, which is there, but there are some bright spots inside it. So those are the calcific calcification spots. So this patient also had an AVM, arteriovenous malformation, which bled. So the AVM had become calcified. So you can see this calcification as well as the hemorrhage. Additionally, in this patient, you can see that the left lateral ventricle, it is compressed and there is midline shift towards the right side. Here you can see, and there's also subfalcine herniation. That means this patient needs urgent treatment and it's an emergency because the left lateral ventricle is compressed. There is midline shift and subfalcine herniation. Now, going back to a child, nine-year-old child who had the hemorrhage. So what we did, we did the CT angiogram on this patient. And CT angiogram is showing these multiple blood vessels. So there were very large, tortuous vessels which were there. And then this is the base images of CT angiogram. And when we did the post-processing, the MIP images, you can see that enlarged arteries are seen from the left middle cerebral artery. So this is the internal carotid artery, the left middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, and similarly on the right side. So if you compare the right and the left, the left side, you see this AVM, which is there. Another patient, 16 year old girl with severe headache, one episode of loss of consciousness. So here we see that this scan was read as normal by the emergency doctors who were not radiologists and the patient was moving. So there were motion artifacts and all. So they thought it was normal and later the patient went for an MRI. But retrospectively, when we, as radiologists, we saw the scan, we find that there is some subtle asymmetry between the two sides. So this is a, a, a very helpful in radiology to look at the symmetry. So look at the right side of the brain, the left side of the brain. If there is something asymmetrical, that means that is the area of the pathology. So again, let's see the normal anatomy here. So this is the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, the trigone of the lateral ventricles. So this is the sylvian fissure, but something is wrong with the sylvian fissure on the right side. Okay, it is a bit hyper dense. So the patient went for MRI. Now for MRI, these are the basic sequences which we are using. The T1 weighted images, axial T2 weighted images, flare images, DW and ADC, the diffusion imaging. Then we take sagittal and coronal T1, T2, depending on the uh, pathology. And then we have the gradient images or the susceptibility weighted images. So now going back to our patient. So this was a T1 weighted image. In T1 weighted images, we are using short PE and TR. This is the time to echo and time to recall, but not going too much into details of the physics part. So the CSF will be black on the T1 weighted image. So it is dark on T1 weighted images. And this is the T2 weighted image where we use a longer uh, echo time. So here, we see that the CSF is bright. Again, for the same patient, this is the flare sequence. Now flare is fluid attenuation inversion recovery sequence. So what we are doing is we are nulling the signal of the CSF. So the CSF, which was bright on T2 weighted image in the flare sequence, it has become dark. So the periventricular pathologies can be seen very well. And here in this patient, in our patient, we are seeing something which T1 and T2, we were not seeing that. But here we see along the sulci, there is brightness. Uh, it is sulcal hyper intensities are there. That means there's something inside which is filling the subarachnoid space. And this is the GRE image. We use a variant of GRI, GRE, which is the 3D GRE, which is the SWI, or it is the susceptibility weighted image which we are using on our scanner. So here you see the blooming, the dark portion. So it is very sensitive to detect the blood. Uh, it depends on the magnetic susceptibility effects of the particular tissues like blood, calcium, they will show blooming on the susceptibility weighted images. So here along the subarachnoid space, we see a lot of blooming is there. So this girl, she had subarachnoid hemorrhage. So when then she was in the MRI, we did an MR angiogram. So here you can see that there is some outpouching from the region of the anterior communicating artery. So here on the axial images, you can see that. And when we did, did the reconstruction color coding, you can see a beautiful aneurysm. So here you have the internal carotid artery, the middle cerebral artery, 
the A1 segment of the right anterior cerebral artery and you see this beautiful aneurysm which is there. Then the patient was um, had under endovascular treatment, coiling was done. You can see the CT scan, post coiling CT scan, which is showing the metallic artifact. And uh, this was the DSA. And after the coiling, this is the post coiling image. Another companion case. Now this was a young girl and uh, I want to show the difference between CT angiogram and MR angiogram in this patient. Now CT angiogram, when we are doing, we are giving contrast, iodinated contrast to the patient. So you can see the blood vessels very well. And then we do these 3D reconstructions to show the aneurysms in various planes. MR angiogram can be done without contrast and with contrast also. CT angiogram, it's very easy. And uh, uh, CT scanners, they are readily available. You can do it even in restless patients also you can do it. But for MRI, the patient, uh, if the patient is restless, it takes more time. Sometimes the availability of the scanner is not there. So MR, those disadvantages are there. And here we have done a non-contrast MR angiogram, which is the TOF angiogram, which is the time of flight angiogram, where we see the unsaturated, uh, the protons in the flowing blood. And because of that, the image is formed. So here we don't see the aneurysm as such filling because of the flowing blood. So there is a signal void here. Similarly, here the A1 segment. So let's go through an anatomy. So this is the internal carotid artery on the right side, the anterior cerebral artery, the, the middle cerebral artery. And this was, would be the part of the anterior cerebral artery, the A1 segment. So that we are not able to see. But when you see the CT angio, it is filling with contrast. That means it is hypoplastic and there is a, a flow void, a signal void, which is there. So uh, MR angiogram, TOF angiogram, you have some artifacts which can be there. But in contrast, CT angiogram, it is beautifully seen. And then on the T2-weighted MR image, you can see this aneurysm. It is showing as a flow void. So um, aneurysm, uh, aneurysmal bleed is a part of, uh, uh, can lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage. In this patient, in this CT angiogram, you can see the blood filling the uh, basal cisterns and the right sylvian cisterns. Many of the patients, they have perimesencephalic SH, where we do not find any aneurysm. But uh, most of the other cases, we may find an aneurysm. So this is the non-traumatic causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here again, you see that subarachnoid hemorrhage is there. I'm reiterating it again and again so that we don't miss the detection of subarachnoid hemorrhage as uh, happened with the previous case. So uh, the blood can go into uh, various spaces of the brain. Yeah. So subarachnoid space we have seen. The other two important spaces are the subdural space and the epidural space. So we know the three layers of the meninges, the dura matter, arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. And the dura matter, it is closely adherent to the sutures. So if a hemorrhage is um, above it, it is the epidural hemorrhage or the extradural hemorrhage, but it will be limited by the sutures because there is very tight dural attachment where the sutures are. And below the Dura, if the hemorrhage happens, it is the subdural space. It is a freely flowing space. And that hemorrhage can spread over a wide area of the brain. So let us look at some of these. Now, this is a post-traumatic case. Post-traumatic cases also, you can get subarachnoid hemorrhage. So here there's hemorrhage in multiple compartments. That are, that's why I've chosen this image. So here you can see that there is a diffuse subdural hemorrhage, which is there along the right cerebral convexity. The hemorrhage is also going along the subarachnoid space. It is also going along the FARX. There is again compression of the right lateral ventricle. There is midline shift mm. towards left side. And additionally, we are seeing this hemorrhagic contusion with some edema. Contrast that with this case. This is a case of extradural hematoma. So here you see that the hemorrhage is localized. It is a localized biconvex uh, lentiform sort of hemorrhage. And generally, they are associated with fractures. These sort of hemorrhage because uh, they are venous, generally venous in origin, because of the tear of the bridging veins in the subdural space, whereas they are frequently arterial in origin, the epidural hematomas. And in this patient, incidentally, you see something black. It is the air. I told you that air has uh, values, H, HU Hounsfield units will be negative. So this is the air which is filling. The patient also had a traumatic pneumocephalus because of the fractures. Another patient so here again, you, you can see that it's a 
well localized hematoma in the epidural space so it's epidural hematoma extradural hematoma and there is an associated fracture now for ct scan we have to change the window and see so this is the bone window and here we can very nicely see the fracture of the bone now you may ask me that uh, sometimes we can get confused with the sutures also so how to differentiate a suture from a fracture so sutures will be at the predictable locations most of the time like this will be the coronal suture and sutures will have a zigzag interdigitating sort of pattern whereas the fracture line will be loosened they will be sharp and they'll be associated with the hematoma now again the importance of bone windows so is reporting this scan so if we just cursory look or we have large volume of work to do and you may say oh there is nothing wrong with this patient you can see the orbits you can see the ethmoid sinus temporal lobes the brain stem the cerebellum the cerebellopontine angle so the brain wise it's okay but if you see carefully then here you can see the mastoid air cells but on the right side you do not see the mastoid air cells now change the window see on the bone window and see the bone window is showing giving you so much more information that there are such extensive bony erosions which are there so generally seen in cases of chronic suppurative otitis media with cholestatoma formation so that changes the entire uh, diagnosis and management of the patient um this is to show you the different uh, varying appearances of uh, sdh so this patient had because it's a workshop so i want to do more and more of these cases so that you know uh, these concepts are very clear so here you see this sdh thin smear of sdh on the left side it's also seen extending along the fax because we know that the subdural space communicates now this is uh, acute sdh will be very bright but as the sdh uh, becomes a bit older you will find that there is some sedimentation of the blood and it's moving more towards a hypodensity so this like this one is a very chronic sdh so you see that it has become very hypodense it's coming closer to the attenuation value of the csf this patient Uh, he had a chronic sdh and on top of that again there is some acute bleed which is there and uh, which is which is a large bleed uh, acute on chronic sdh which is leading to uh, compression and again midline shift on mri hemorrhage is a different ball game because aging of blood on mri on different sequences it will appear different so first we have we know that uh, the hemoglobin it's the oxyhemoglobin now if the blood is there in the brain it will decompose into various products so first oxyhemoglobin form into dehydroxyhemoglobin then methemoglobin methemoglobin initially it will be intracellular then it will be extracellular and then hemosiderin will be formed depending on that the signal intensity on t1 weighted and t2 weighted images will change so like this hematoma it's it's a more acute hematoma because the signal intensity low on t2 weighted image whereas this is more of a subacute or chronic hematoma another patient now here we see um, hemorrhage some bleed is there uh, some bleed is there and with edema but additionally what i want to show in this patient a young patient presented with seizures and headache so here you see this is the part of the superior sagittal sinus now there is a marked hyperdensity in the region of superior sagittal sinus again just a magnified view showing the same now when we do the mri of this patient so this is t2 weighted axial image here again we can see the hematoma the these are the venous infarction hemorrhagic venous infarction which has happened the lateral ventricles this is the image on flare axial flare sequence and on gre as i've shown earlier also this will show extensive blooming because of the hemorrhage and what i want to show is normally the flow voids will be very dark but here it's a normal expected position of the superior sagittal sinus it is not dark it has become bright here on flare sequences also you can see and blooming is seen on susceptibility weighted sequence so then we did an mr venogram for this patient now this is the expected location of the superior sagittal sinus so you do not see a good nice superior sagittal sinus instead it is thrombosed so it was a case of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with hemorrhagic venous infarction now these patients very important to diagnose because they recover very well with anticoagulant therapy so this was one patient which he had superior sagittal sinus thrombosis here you do not see the anterior part of the superior sagittal sinus but after receiving the therapy when we did the uh, scan after a few weeks we can see that recanalization of the superior sagittal sinus has happened okay another patient 
Uh, this patient is a 37 year old lady with headache and visual blurring. So we see a mass. This is a T2 weighted image. We see a T2 hyper intense mass, which is there. Again, the superior sagittal sinus. Now this mass is invading. It's extending into the superior sagittal sinus. And you see these pseudopods, this finger like projections. This is the edema around the tumor. So again, going back to it, this is the tumor. You see the edema. It's also involving the corpus callosum. That the tumor is distended the superior sagittal sinus. This is a part of the normal flow void of the superior sagittal sinus seen anteriorly. But at the site of the tumor, you see it is filled up with this mass. And additionally, what I want to point out is because there is raised intracranial tension, features of papilledema raised intracranial hypertension are also there. So intracranial hypertension, and you see the empty cella. Cella is also becoming empty. Then T1 weighted image and post contrast. T1 weighted image. So T1 weighted image, you see it is hypointense lesion. And on contrast, it is showing a homogeneous uh, intense enhancement with an enhancing dural tail adjacent to it. It is a meningioma. And again, we, we are doing this MR venogram. Here you see the sinus very well. Here also you see some part of the sinus. But this is the part where the tumor is invading the superior sagittal sinus. And as I told you, this patient had papilledema. Now we can see the features of papilledema on MRI. So Axial images, and you see the optic nerve, the perioptic CSF spaces, they're so prominent. There's some tortuosity of the optic nerves, and you can see the bulging, the intraocular protrusion of the optic nerve head in the globe. Again, the sagittal image showing the same. Another patient, this is a very interesting case. A, a, a patient presented, she had minimal symptoms, only tinnitus. And uh, she came for uh, imaging of the brain and angiogram. So when the technician was doing it, he said, uh, ma'am, I'm doing the processing. So initially we get these sort of images. So we acquired these images. And when he did the post-processing, he found a lot of you know, abnormal blood vessels here. He said, there's some vessels are there. I'll just clean it up and remove and delete these. And I'll just give this image, which is nicely showing the internal carotid and anterior and middle cerebral arteries and the basilar and all. So I said, no, the patient has got tinnitus. So this was actually a case of dural AV fistula. So on the venogram, you can see this abnormal communication on this left side. So again, the venogram, this is superior sagittal sinus, the coronal view, the transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus going into the internal jugular vein. Now this patient underwent treatment embolization and then later you can see that the cleanup of the abnormal vessels are there. So the patient was cured. Here also, now you in the, this Excel image, you do not see those abnormal vessels. Now, vascular imaging, stroke is very important and frequently we see patients coming with slurring of speech and weakness on one side of the body. CT scan we do immediately fast. It's very easy to interpret imaging. You can see a hypodensity. This is in the region of right middle cerebral artery, insular cortex compared with opposite side. You see this hypodensity, you say, oh, it's an infarct. Then now we have this uh, software which does the automatic um, calculation of the aspect score. Then we do a CT angiogram. CT angiogram, you see that left middle cell blood is very well visualized, but you do not see the right MCA. So occlusion of the right MCA is there. Large vessel occlusion is there. So fast imaging and transfer decisions are taken and the patient outcome is improved. But there are some cases where we also do MRI. So for example, this patient, when CT scan was done, it was interpreted as normal. So the frontal horns of lateral ventricle, third ventricle, you see the caudate nucleus, globus pallidus, putamen, the anterior and the posterior limb of the internal capsule, third ventricle, thalamus. But when you do the MRI, you can see that there is this is diffusion weighted image. So there's brightness in the region of posterior limb of the internal capsule. So this was an infarct. Very well seen on diffusion weighted images. Other subset of patients where um, MRI is very useful is the posterior fossa infarct. So this patient also, you do not see much in the brain stem, but when you do the diffusion weighted images, because of the infarct, the pump in the cell membrane that stops and there is cellular swelling, there is cytotoxic edema, there is restricted diffusion of water, which is very well picked up by the diffusion weighted imaging. So it is shows bright on the DWI image. Another patient with acute infarct. Here, very subtle hypodensity is there in the region of caudate nucleus on CT scan. But on MRI, it's very bright, very apparent. And additionally, you can see these additional two small foci of acute infarct. 
some of the early signs uh, which we can if we look carefully and closely and um, good enough uh, images are there then you see that there is sometimes hyperdensity in the mca so that is the dense mca sign which we can see in early sign of stroke and later on these sort of cases can progress to a full blown infarct this is in the wedge shaped infarct in the mca dead tree um, we can have these sort of uh, patients with axial T2 weighted images showing bithalamic hyperintensities, the diffusion weighted images showing bright signal, ADC image, they have to be interpreted together. If you see something bright on diffusion, dark on ADC, it is an acute infarct. So this was actually a case of artery or percheron infarction, but we have to give a differential. So differential based on this image would be uh, sometimes in deep venous sinus thrombosis. If there is a um, uh, occlusion of the internal cerebral veins, vein of gallon, straight sinus, you can get these sort of uh, abnormalities. And in cases of encephalitis also, we'll see those cases. Another patient, here you see that posterior circulation infarcts are there. Both the PCA territories, they are involved. And now when we see such infarct, we can also do an MR angiogram. So initially I had shown you a TOF angiogram, but now I'm showing you a contrast angiogram. So we have given contrast and right from the arch of aorta to the vertex, we are looking at the blood vessels. And here you see the aortic arch, the vessels coming out from here, common carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, external carotid artery branches. And you can see that there's no significant occlusion in this particular patient. Another patient, so this is the non-contrast TOF angiogram for comparison. So here you see that maybe, you know, there is some occlusion of the right side MCA. But when you give contrast, you find that there is a thin right MCA which is seen. So it's not totally occluded. So we try to do a contrast angiogram in such patients because it gives us more additional information. Another patient, but this patient did not have atherosclerotic disease, but this was a case of tachyosis arteritis. So here we can see that the left side, the brachiocephalic, subclavian, uh, the subclavian and the right side brachiocephalic, the common carotid, the internal carotid, left side, they're all uh, involved. But this was a very interesting patient. Um, suddenly uh, came with dizziness, ataxia, and um, here you see again a very sharply demarcated hyperintensity on axial T2 weighted image, which is there involving the right middle cerebellar peduncle. This is the pons, the part of the cerebellum, the fourth ventricle here. And on diffusion, it's bright, so obviously it's an infarct. And when we did an MR angiogram for this patient, this patient actually had dissection. Dissection was there. Uh, the patient uh, had gone to a saloon and um, there was some manipulation done uh, with the head and neck. Some, uh, and because of that, there was a dissection and it led to a pseudoaneurysm formation. So you can see to the right vertebral artery, there was a pseudoaneurysm, which is bulging. You can very well see on this image. Um, in MR scan, in addition to the diffusion, we can also do a perfusion scan in many of the patients. So this is diffusion weighted image, which is showing the infarction, the corresponding ADC image showing the dark signal. And when we give the contrast, we can get all these parameters. This is relative cerebral blood volume, the blood flow, time to peak, mean transit time. We can get all these parameters. And then we try to see whether there is any diffusion perfusion mismatch. For example, in this patient, we, there is no mismatch. Another patient. So this is the diffusion and perfusion. And the perfusion diffusion, they are, this perfusion deficit is a bit more than the diffusion. So it was a case of mismatch. It shows the uh, salvageable tissue, the tissue which we can salvage by thrombolysis or thrombectomy. Another patient, other, other uses of MR perfusion would be, suppose we just see this image and we do not do any contrast or any perfusion. We'll see, oh, it's a cystic lesion, which is hypo-intense on T1 and hyper-intense on T2-weighted images. But when you do the perfusion, you see that so much increased vascularity is there. So this was a case actually of a glioma because increased va vascularity was there. Another case. So this is a post-contrast images, which is showing an enhancing lesion, which is near the ventricle. There's a lot of edema around it. Compression of the left lateral ventricle is there. Midline shift is there. On perfusion, it was not that much vascular. Uh, the perfusion was low. And on ADC, it is showing restricted diffusion. So another uh, place where diffusion weighted images are very useful is the case of lymphoma or densely cellular tumors. They will also show restricted diffusion. Abscesses will also show restricted diffusion and the perfusion will not be that much. 
again an enhancing tumor in the periventricular region diffusion restriction we expect a lymphoma we did a stereotactic biopsy and it was proved to be a lymphoma another patient here we see a mass an extensive edema compression of right lateral ventricle midline shift on post contrast we see this irregular nodular thick enhancement so another tool we use for our help which is the spectroscopy so on spectroscopy we find this high choline peak and this is the na peak and this is the lactate peak so let us look a bit at the spectroscopy how does a normal spectrum look like so spectroscopy it tells us about the chemical or the metabolite data in the brain tissue so nah is the normal neuronal marker and creatine is the internal reference standard choline it's uh, indicates the membrane turnover so in a malignant lesion where there are rapidly growing proliferating cells increased membrane turnover you find the increased choline peak and they are assigned different pp ppm values they are part per million so na uh, is the ppm value here creatinine is 3 to na is 2 creatinine is 3 choline is 3.2 and we acquire this at different t this is at intermediate t of 135 or 144 milliseconds some people say if you take it at a short t you will see many more metabolites this is taken at a short t of 30 milliseconds and different peaks they have different values on the x axis depending on the parts per million and then you can see the height of the peak and calculate the various different ratios this is a interesting case uh, which showed that uh, there is a bleed here acute bleed young patient came to us with acute bleed no history of hypertension and here you see extensive edema around it then this is the t1 weighted image again you see the acute bleed at that time we did a spectroscopy choline was not that much raised again after 6 weeks when the patient came to us the hematoma has now resolved you can see that hemosiderin rim is forming the edema is still very extensive or this is the t1 weighted image so then we did a contrast study contrast you see that the tumor is enhancing it is actually a tumoral bleed this is enhancing there is in foci of increased perfusion and the choline peak was also raised so multi parametric mri using the perfusion data spectroscopy data helps us in problem solving approach it also helps us when there is a residual or a recurrent tumor for example in this case this patient had a, a glioma which was operated you can see the post operative cavity extensive radiotherapy changes then post contrast you can see some enhancement but it's the perfusion which helps us showing the increased perfusion showing that it is a recurrent tumor now let us look at some infective pathologies and other pathologies so 56 year old female presented with sudden onset vomiting followed by slurring of speech unconsciousness and weakness of bilateral lower limbs here we see t2 hyperintensity involving the bilateral hippocampal region also the brain stem so that was a case of encephalitis now encephalitis in that particular case was an autoimmune encephalitis but we can have viral encephalitis also so bilateral thalamic involvement it's a, a typical involvement for the japanese encephalitis so case of japanese encephalitis here this is the herpes simplex encephalitis where we see involvement of the medial temporal lobes the insular cortex the hippocampal parahippocampal region again here nicely you can see the medial temporal lobes this is the temporal horns of the lateral ventricle the hippocampal region so the case of herpes simplex encephalitis the importance of contrast in mri so this is the pre contrast image and look at the post contrast image when you do the post contrast it lights up the brain lights up and you can see the meningeal enhancement and additionally you also see a small enhancing nodule which is there so for when we are suspecting infection we'd like to do a contrast study so that helps us to give a better diagnosis so you do a contrast study in this patients of meningitis you will find that there is enhancement around the um, optic chasm the supracellular cisterns around the brain stem if you take a sagittal mri you can see beautifully the supracellular this is cella supracellular region you can see the contrast enhancement around the brain stem around the cerebellar folia so case of meningitis again meningitis and you can see the lower cranial nerves they are also enhancing the temporal lobes the temporal horns they are also dilated the patient also started having hydrocephalus and this is the, the fifth cranial nerve the trigeminal nerves which are also showing enhancement now this is patient where conglomerate ring enhancing lesions are there and uh, when we did a spectroscopy high lipid lactate peak was there so it is a case of tuberculoma so here you see in infratentorially also supracellular region the sylvian cisterns you can see the enhancing lesions and 
sometimes in some patients we have the extensive enhancement going into the cervical spinal canal as well another patient this patient had listeria and you can see the rhomboid cephalitis so this is a part of midbrain pons and medulla which is showing the abnormal signal and here the medial temporal lobes are also involved and the part of the brain stem are involved so case of listeria rhomboid cephalitis now the, these patients generally with infections they have hydrocephalus so you can see that the normal uh, we have seen the frontal horns in the previous patients where they were collapsed but here you see dilatation of the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles the body is also dilated and when you give the contrast the ventricular margin is enhancing in this case of ventriculitis here you see the ventricular margin is enhancing now another patient now you would think oh maybe it's a tubocloma you can see a lesion which is t2 hypo intense there is some surrounding edema in the thalamic region coronal image again you can see it diffusion there is no restriction perfusion it's not increased so you say it's not non neoplastic lesion and when you give the contrast you can see a peripheral rim enhancement and there is an eccentric target sign this is eccentric target sign and a peripheral rim enhancement it was a case of toxoplasmosis and toxoplasmosis has a particular prediction for basal ganglia thalamic region corticomedullary region this is an hiv positive patient with toxoplasmosis another patient so here we see a small lesion so ring enhancing lesions they have a multiple uh, uh, differential diagnosis you have to see the proper clinical context and then look at the various images this was a case of neurocystic sarcosis so very small enhancing lesion which was there neurocystic so you can find florid lesions multiple lesions they generally smaller than tuberculomas you will see scolex around them so this is these are the scolex and on swi sometimes they are calcified you can see them again pre contrast post contrast images you can see multiple ncc which are there again t2 weighted image and here is a magnified view showing the scolex <coughs> another patient 6 year old boy low grade intermittent fever vomiting cough cold altered sensorium headache photophobia and neck pain and this patient we find multiple white matter hyperintensities are there periventricular white matter going to the subcortical region sagittal images also you find these white matter lesions the brain stem is involved even the cervical spinal cord is involved so it's a case of edem acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and post contrast images you see the enhancement again the sagittal post contrast images this is another patient showing multiple lesions with edema lot of lesions are there smaller lesions also there post contrast you can see the enhancement thick nodular irregular ring enhancement is there and this patient was a case of bronchogenic carcinoma the primary was the bronchogenic carcinoma these are all metastatic lesions so another differential of the ring enhancing lesions so another lesion here and with covid we have seen many of these lesions the colon was not raised lipid lactate peak was raised in this patient this patient was operated it was a case of fungal infection fungal infection mucormycosis near the paranasal sinus these also see 10 year old child with acute onset diplopia and headache on examination papillary edema and right lr palsy so if you see this patient we have done a multiparametric mri so t1 weighted image post contrast t1 weighted you see that there is a peripheral rim enhancement irregular contrast enhancement of the solid portion so there is a solid nodular portion and eccentric um, uh, portion here nodular mural nodule which is there T2 weighted image, you can see the cyst, then diffusion weighted images, and uh, flare sequence and the uh, GRE sequence, which is showing some blooming. So case of uh, pyrocytic astrocytoma in a child. MRI, uh, we have to look at the clinical context, and there are various other uh, techniques and sequences for our help. For example, in this patient, if you just look at the MRI, you'll see oh, the orbit are seen, the temporal lobes, the brain stem, cerebellum, nothing are. remarkable in this patient this is the coronal image then when when we do the thin sections we find that something is there in the internal auditory canal on the right side i'll show you more images so here you see the left internal auditory canal the right internal auditory canal and when you give the contrast there's something some small lesion which is enhancing here so a case of schwannoma in the right internal auditory canal so this is pre contrast and the post contrast so you can do thin sections you can do cis The early images had shown there were cis sequences, so the thin titrated images. Again, another patient. So it's a 
heterogeneous solid cystic lesion. This is the solid nodule, the cystic portion in the medulla. When you see the sagittal image, so this is midbrain, pons, and medulla. And from the medulla, there is one lesion which is projecting out. It has got the solid component, and this is the cystic component. So our neurosurgeons, they wanted to know that, you know, how are the tracts for this patient? So another thing which we are doing is the diffusion tensor imaging or the tractography which we are using. Now, white matter tracts, there is anisotropy. So uh, using that, we can see the uh, delineate the white matter tract. So these are the corticospinal tract going from the cortex to the spinal cord here. So the right side here, this is the lesion. So on the left side, this lesion was more on the left side. You could not see this properly. But after surgery, the uh, surgery was done, this lesion was removed. It was actually a schwannoma. And then you can see beautifully the tracts, the reestablishment of the tracts is there. So the tracts were just displaced. They were not infiltrated. They were not destroyed. So that information was provided by this DTI or the diffusion tensor imaging. So again, if you see the left side, the tracts are not there. They were displaced compressed and displaced. But after surgery, we are able to see and the patient has no deficits, the patient is doing fine. So I've tried to show you some of the neuroimaging cases. And um, I've tried to show right from the basic to the more advanced ones. So I hope uh, it's been a useful session for you. And um, uh, now my colleagues will uh, take over and uh, they'll be dealing with chest imaging. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Muna, for a very explicit lecture. I'm sure all the participants must have really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, can you please introduce your next speaker, please? Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Nishan Kumar Jha, the dynamic young radiologist. Uh, he'll be talking about the chest X-ray. Thank you. So we welcome Dr. Nishan. Can you please start your presentation? Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Nishan Kumar Jha, consultant radiologist at Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. So today I'll be dealing with the basics of chest radiographs. And I'll discuss with the pattern approach that a radiologist follows whenever he is given a chest radiograph. I have divided my lecture in two parts. In the first part, I'll be dealing with the commonly used views in practice, followed by the commonly encountered pathologies that we deal in our routine practice. So first, we'll discuss with the views So this view is the frontal view, the frontal chest radiograph. The frontal chest radiograph are of two types. One is the PA view and the other is the AP view. So this is the PA view that we are looking at. This is the lateral view of the chest radiograph. We'll discuss in brief the views that we have seen now, how to obtain them. So in the standard posterior anterior view, the patient faces the cassette with shoulders rotated externally so that they don't obscure the lung field, whereas the chin of the patient faces upwards. Hence, it does not obscure the lung apices. The distance between the cassette to the x-ray tube is 180 centimeters. In the lateral view, the patient is lateral to the cassette and the arms are up and out of the way. The frontal views, as I had uh, told earlier, are of two types. One is the AP and the other is the PA view. So this that we are looking at, this is the AP view, which is the anteroposterior view. The anteroposterior view is usually reserved for those patients who are critically ill or bedridden, who cannot stand up. And the image that we are seeing here is the PA view. The PA view is the most commonly used view and the preferred view. 
in patients who can stand. So both of these are frontal views. Now the question is how can we differentiate between the AP and the PA view? So one way that we can differentiate between these two views is by looking at the scapula. If you look at the scapula in the AP view, the scapula as the patient is not having any external rotation of the shoulder. So the scapula actually overlies or overlaps the lung parenchyma. Whereas in the AP view, if you see that the scapula is away from the lung field as the patient has already rotated his shoulders externally. So that is one of the ways. The other thing that we can see here is that in AP views, there is apparent cardiomegaly. Now these two radiographs are of the same patient, but we can see that in the AP view, the heart appears enlarged. The reason for this is that the heart is away from the cassette more compared to that in the PA view. So the more further the heart is from the cassette, larger will be the image. Hence in AP views, we usually do not comment on the cardiac size. We come to the uh, anatomy of the lobes. So in the right lung, there are three lobes. This is the right upper lobe, which is antero superiorly. Just below it, antero inferiorly is the right middle lobe. And posteriorly, we can see the right lower lobe. In the left lung, there are only two lobes. The one which is present anteriorly is the left upper lobe. And the one which is present posteriorly is the left lower lobe. Now, the important thing here is that whenever we look at a pathology which obscures the cardiac margin, then that helps in telling us that we are dealing with a pathology which is located in the right middle lobe. But if the lesion is in the right lower lobe, then it is not going to, then it is not going to obscure the cardiac margin. The cardiac margin can be seen well. So by looking at the Silhout sign, we can distinguish whether we are dealing with a lesion which is there in the right middle lobe or the right lower lobe. So now I'll be telling you how to read a chest X-ray. There are two ways of reading a chest X-ray. One is the inside to outside approach and the other is the outside to inside approach. I usually follow the inside to outside approach. So in the inside to outside approach, first <clears throat> we look at the central airways, that is the trachea. We look at the caliber of the trachea and whether there is any displacement of the trachea present or not. If the trachea is displaced, then we have to think or we have to look at some paratracheal pathology like a paratracheal lymph node or a upper lower pathology. In these two pathologies, the trachea will be shifted or pushed to the contralateral side, the opposite side. Whereas in fibrotic pathologies where there is loss of lung volume, the trachea will be shifted to the same side. From the trachea, we shift our attention to the right bronchus, the left bronchus. The angle between these two bronchus is very important because they usually have an acute angle. If the angle is more than 70 degrees, then <clears throat> there is a mediastinal pathology like a subcarinal, a large subcarinal lymph node or at times left atrial enlargement. Then we look at the heart. We look at the right heart border, the left heart border, the size of the heart. After that, we look at the great vessels, that is the aorta, the arch of the aorta. Then we have a look at the hyla, that is the right hyla and the left hyla. We compare these two hylas. And commonly, in normal cases, we see that the lateral margin of the hyla is concave, whereas in cases of pulmonary artery hypertension, the margin that we see here becomes convex. After that, we look at the diaphragms. In the diaphragms, we look at the contour of the diaphragm, the area below the diaphragm, that is the subdiaphragmatic space. We look for any air that can be seen there. Then we look at the costophrenic angles. These costophrenic angles are usually blunted in pleural effusions. Then we have a look at the lung parenchyma. 
we look at the symmetry of lung parenchyma on both the sides they should be equally loosened in a well positioned film then we should look for any opacity in the lung parenchyma it can be a consolidation it can be a pulmonary nodule it can be an effusion after having a look at the lung parenchyma we shift our focus to the bony cage there we have to see the spine the paraspinal stripes we have to look at the ribs we need to look at the clavicle as well as the scapula there we can find some lytic lesion sclerotic lesion expensile lesion we can look for fractures in traumatic cases and lastly we need to look at the soft tissues in the soft tissues we should look for any subcutaneous emphysematous change any soft tissue bulge or in female patients we should look at both the breast shadows whether there is any history of mastectomy or not and so forth now as far as the lateral view is concerned we don't have to look at many things in lateral view we, we just need to have a look at few of the important spaces which are there in the lateral view so this is the retrosternal air space the retrosternal air space is bounded anteriorly by the sternum and posteriorly by the ascending aorta this space is usually less than 2.5 centimeters if this space increases then we should think of pulmonary emphysema and this space is obliterated whenever there is an anterior mediastinal mass or in the cases of right ventricular hypertrophy there is another lucent space that we can see posterior to the heart especially that it is posterior to the left atrium and as we move from superior to inferior we see that the degree of lucency increases this is a normal finding this is a finding which we expect in normal cases but if we don't see this increasing lucency then we should think of some pathology like a left atrial enlargement or a consolidation involving the lower lung and lastly we look at the diaphragm the one which is projecting superiorly is the right diaphragm and the one which is projecting inferiorly is the left diaphragm then these are the four commonly encountered areas which are the hidden areas and these are the areas where maximum number of times people miss findings so whenever looking at an x-ray we should always give special emphasis on these four areas these four areas are namely the lung apices the hilum the heart that is the retrocardiac area should be looked upon and lastly the diaphragm that is the space including the subdiaphragmatic space now we move to the second part of our lecture where we'll uh, discuss few of the commonly encountered pathologies so what do we see here in this radiograph we see here that there is evidence of a well defined pulmonary nodule a soft tissue opacity is there in the left mid lung zone so what is a pulmonary nodule pulmonary nodule is a well defined round to oval soft tissue opacity which is usually less than 3 cm in size now why the size criteria of 3 cm has been kept the reason being any nodule which is more than 3 cm is usually a malignant pathology unless proven otherwise so if a lesion is less than 3 cm in size then it can be benign or a malignant so when we look at a pulmonary nodule we should have few things in our mind first how many number of pulmonary nodules are there whether it is single or whether there are multiple second we should look at the margins of the lesion whether the margin of the lesion is smooth which is seen in cases of benign etiologies or whether the margins are irregular speculated which are seen in malignant pathologies then we also need to look at the internal architecture of the nodule whether there are any differential densities like fat densities cavitations which can help us in narrowing down our list of differentials we should also pay special emphasis on the underlying and the overlying ribs that are there whether there are any lytic changes within the ribs or not that helps us in telling us whether there is any chest wall involvement or not okay 
So we move to the next pathology. So what do we see here? So this is a case of pneumothorax. We can see here there is a well-defined area of radiolucency involving the right lung. And this line, which is shown in arrows, is the visceral pleural line. So the areas which are lateral to this line, there is absence of lung markings. And the area which is medial to this line shows the collapsed lung, which is seen in cases of pneumothorax. So we have three findings. One, we can see the visceral pleural line. The, then the area which is lateral to it is radiolucent. It will not show any lung markings. And the area which is medial to it will show us the collapsed lung. Usually in pneumothorax, we don't have much of a mediastinal shift, except in cases of large tension pneumothorax, where there is significant mass effect on the mediastinum and that causes a contralateral mediastinal shift. Many a times, uh, it becomes difficult to ascertain whether we are dealing with pneumothorax or not. So there is one trick that we can do. We can repeat the X-ray in an expiratory view. So in an expiratory view, what happens is that the lung volume reduces, the diaphragm moves up and the density of the lung increases. Whereas if it is pneumothorax, then these findings will not be seen. The lung volume will not shrink and the density of the lung is also not going to increase. So that is one of the ways we can confirm our finding of pneumothorax. There is one more thing here that I'd like to mention that according to British Thoracic Society guidelines, we can classify pneumothorax as small pneumothorax or a large pneumothorax. So a small pneumothorax is a one uh, where the distance from the chest wall to the collapsed lung at the level of hyla is less than two centimeters. Whereas in larger pneumothorax, this distance is more than two centimeters. And whenever we look at pneumothorax, we should also look for other findings. We should not just get stuck on that finding because in pneumothorax, there are also other findings that can be associated like a pneumomediastinum can be there. There could be a pneumoperitoneum. In traumatic cases, there could be uh, rib fractures, there could be subcutaneous emphysema. So we should look also for those findings. Next, we move to pulmonary artery hypertension. So in pulmonary artery hypertension, there are three main important findings that we usually get. First, there will be cardiomegaly. The cardiomegaly is because of right ventricular enlargement. Then we get dilated pulmonary arteries. We can see that both the hyla are prominent. And third, there is peripheral pruning of the pulmonary vessels. Okay. So these are the three findings which is usually seen in pulmonary artery hypertension. Now here we can see that there is evidence of a soft tissue opacification involving the left mid and lower lung zone with obliteration of the left costophrenic angle and superiorly we can see that there is a concave margin which is known as a meniscus sign this is typically seen in pleural effusions so this is a case of pleural effusion what happens is in large pleural effusions is that due to the mass effect there is contralateral mediastinal shift but we need to look at one thing that if there is collapse of the underlying lung, then it tries to pull the mediastinum towards its side. So in many of the cases, even if the effusion is large, there is no mediastinal shift because of underlying lung collapse, which tends to pull in the mediastinum, showing thereby no significant mediastinal shift. So what do we see in this radiograph? We can see that below both the domes of diaphragm, there is evidence of free air. And the air is continuing across the central dome of diaphragm, which is also known as a continuous diaphragm sign. So this is a classical case of pneumoperitoneum. And this is one of the findings that should never be missed. 
So whenever we look at a pneumoperitoneum, then we should alert the physician or the clinician, and we should look for the cause of the pneumoperitoneum, which could be due to a hollow viscous perforation in peptic ulcer disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or it could be due to post-traumatic cases, iatrogenic cases. Okay. There, there is one differential here. We'll see the yeah, next image. Air within we can see here, if we look carefully, that there are multiple small septations that we can see. So these septations are nothing but these are the hostrations of the colon. And this is interposition of colon between the right dome of the diaphragm superiorly and the liver inferiorly. This sign is known as a chiliarity sign. And if the patient comes with pain, this is known as chiliarity syndrome. So one should also be aware of this condition while dealing with such cases. So to differentiate between pneumoperitoneum and chiliarity is pneumoperitoneum, the air will be free, come, come, there will be no septations or the hostrations of the colon, whereas in the chiliarity, we will be seeing the hostrations of the colon. Now, look at this case. What do you see here? We see here, there is a large cavitary lesion. So, what is a cavity? A cavity is a lesion which has air within. We can see here, that this lucency that we are seeing here superiorly is the air and below it is a fluid. So we can see here that there is an air fluid level. Hmm. So this is typical case of a lung abscess. Now, a cavitary lesion is always not a lung abscess. It can also be other causes. It can be also due to other causes like a hydrated cyst or a malignancy. So how can we narrow down our differentiation? We need to look at the thickness of the wall of the cavity. If the wall thickness is less, if the margins of the cavity are very smooth, if we are seeing a horizontal air fluid level, then we are dealing with an infective condition like a lung abscess. If the air fluid level margin is wavy, then one should think of a hydrated cyst. We move to the next case. Here also we see a cavitary lesion, but the morphology is separate. We can see that the walls are very thick. Then the walls, the inner margin of the wall is not very regular. It's very irregular. It's very ill-defined. So this cannot be an abscess. This should be a neoplastic lesion. And it was proved to be a cavitating squamous cell carcinoma. So while looking at a cavitary lesion, we should look at the thickness of the wall, the margins, whether they are smooth or whether they are irregular, and also for the presence of air fluid levels. So by looking at these three criteria, we can help the in differentiating whether we are dealing with an uh, abscess or whether we are dealing with a neoplastic condition. So I'd like to end my session here and I'd like to thank you all for being patient and listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cha, for a very nice and lucid presentation. I'm sure all our uh, participants would be very benefited by it. Uh, Dr. Mona, could you please introduce the next speaker? Yes, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Arko Bhattacharya and he'll be speaking about the different lines and tubes which we see on the chest x-ray. Very important for the anesthetist to know the position of the tubes and lines. And it's a short presentation, but very important presentation. So over to Dr. Arko. everyone uh, this is the video diagnosis at institute of neurosciences kolkata 
and uh, i'll be presenting a short presentation on the topic of uh, radiology of lines and tubes in icu uh, along with few uh, radiological features of uh, ct and x ray features of uh, covid 19 pneumonia which we uh, obviously will encounter in these days at uh, any icu setting so i'll first uh, share my screen with you guys So uh, first, I will discuss about the uh, normal positioning of different uh, uh, lines and tubes, uh, uh, which we see in X-ray, and then I will tell about the their abnormal positioning and the related complication. Now, first, uh, this is a nasogastric tube, and we can see that it is coming all the way down through the esophagus into the stomach, and its tip is reaching up to the region of the uh, fundus of the stomach. And it is uh, correctly positioned in the tube. Now, coming to the uh, improper position tubes, uh, in the first figure we can see that the tube is there within the uh, esophagus, but it appears to be coiled within the mouth and in the cervical esophagus, and its tip lies within the cervical esophagus. And in the figure two, we can see that the uh, tube is uh, improperly placed within the trachea and going down below up to the right main bronchus. Now coming to the endotracheal tubes, uh, which are uh, used like on daily basis for patients uh, to secure their uh, uh, airway. And here we can see that this is a correctly positioned endotracheal tube with its tip lying approximately three to five centimeter above the carina. Now coming to the improper position tubes, uh, here we can see that the uh, ET tube has gone down into the right main bronchus with resultant hyperinflation of the right lung and collapse of the left lung. And in the same patient, when the tube was repositioned uh, and uh, there is this uh, uh, proper inflation of the left lung. Now, in this child, we can see that the uh, ET tube was uh, improperly positioned within the esophagus, uh, leading to uh, air within the uh, esophagus and uh, dilatation of the stomach with this air. Now, coming to the tracheostomy tube, here we can see that uh, the uh, tip of the tracheostomy tube should lie above the medial end of both the clavicles. And here we can see a correctly positioned tube. In here, uh, the tube is a bit uh, low down, along with some uh, complications which occurred during the insertion of the tube, like this uh, surgical emphysema is there, left sided large pneumothorax is there. This we can see the collapsed lung margin, along with pneumomediastinum. Now coming to the intercostal chest strains, which are put regularly in ICU patients uh, for draining uh, pleural effusion, uh, pneumothorax, pneumothorax uh, for draining uh, pneumothorax. And here we can see that it is correctly placed within the pleural space in the intercostal region. Now here we can see that this tube is uh, positioned pretty low down. And on the CT of the same patient, we saw that the tube was reaching or pushing into the liver parenchyma instead of going into the pleural space. And the pleural effusion uh, is still there, which is not drained. Now coming to the central venous catheters, which are also very important in ICU setting for delivering fluid or drugs to a patient. And uh, in a correctly positioned central venous catheter, the tip uh, of the tube should lie distal to all these venous bulbs in the region of this uh, brachiocephalic vein or at the region of SVC. Here we can see that the tube is correctly placed and reaching up to the region of the SVC. In the uh, figure 10, we can see that the tube is correctly positioned, but uh, during its insertion, there occurred uh, some complications giving rise to this large pneumothorax on the left side. And here also, we can see that the tube is like uh, almost in correct position, but there is this huge mediastinal widening and this soft tissue in the right paravertebral region, which later on proved to be a mediastinal hematoma on CT. 
Now coming to the pacemakers, they are usually of two types, single chamber. Here we can see a single chamber pacemaker with its uh, electrode reaching up to the region of RV apex. And here we can see that this is a dual chamber pacemaker. And one, one of the uh, electrodes is reaching up to the region of right atrium and another one is reaching up to the RV apex. Now these are uh, uh, automated implantable cardiac defibrillators, which uh, look almost the same as that of the the, the uh, um, pacemakers. And but these dense bands are there along the electrodes, and here we can see that the dense bands are there, and this is an AIC. Now coming to a few radiological features of uh, COVID-19 pneumonia, which uh, we are encountering on daily basis, um, especially in ICU setting. Uh, now, the coming to the key CT features. Uh, CT is the modality of choice for detection of uh, the lung involvement, the extent of lung involvement. Now, the key CT features of COVID pneumonia are uh, ground glassing, crazy paving, vascular dilatation, traction bronchitis, and subdural bands. The uh, last three are uh, mainly seen in case of like uh, in the late phase of uh, COVID-19 infection. And this occurs mainly due to uh, fibrosis. The first coming to ground glassing, here we can see that both the lungs are involved in the subdural uh, peripheral zone in the lower lobes. Diffuse ground glassing is there. Now crazy paving. Crazy paving is just uh, ground glassing superimposed with interlobular septal thickening due to fibrosis. So this we call uh, in our language as the crazy pain. Now coming to vascular dilatation, here we can see that uh, this vessel appears dilated within the area of ground glassing, most probably due to surrounding fibrosis. Same mechanism applies to the bronchi also, and the bronchi appears uh, dilated with surrounding ground glassing, which may be due to fibrosis. Here also we can see uh, this uh, fibrotic uh, subplural bands in the in the areas which were predominantly affected by the ground glassing in the active phase of the disease, they gradually get replaced by subplural bands uh, in the later phase of the disease. And uh, here we can see that uh, the X-ray X-ray is uh, not that sensitive in case of uh, early disease for detection of early diseases. Uh, there is this uh, the X-ray and the CT of the same patient. And here we can see that uh, on the X-ray, both the lung fields are completely fine. Whereas in the CT, there is this uh, patchy ground glassing in the near the right CP angle, which was completely undetected on the X-ray. But X-rays we use in case of follow-up, like here in this patient at our hospital at admission, his lungs were like this and patchy airspace opacities are there in both the lung fields. But uh, it started to gradually increase after four hours. And uh, after 48 hours, we can see that these patchy opacities are completely filling almost the entire lungs on both the sides. And unfortunately, a few hours after the x-ray, the patient died because of the disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arko. Uh, are there any other questions which the audience would like to ask? Uh, this is Dr. Arko, uh, currently working as Associate Consultant in the Department of uh, Radio Diagnosis at Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. And uh, I'll be presenting a short presentation on the topic of uh, radiology of line. Any questions? Please put your questions up in the chat box. Don't see any questions in the chat box right now. Dr. Mona, could you please introduce the next speaker, please, Dr. Shubhrata Nag? Yes. So uh, we have seen the cross-sectional imaging of uh, various vascular pathologies. We have seen how stroke looks like or so, um, 
uh, patient of aneurysm and uh, arteriovenous malformation. But now endovascular treatment has a great role to play in the treatment of these vascular pathologies. And um, Dr. Subrato Nag, the consultant interventional radiologist, he will be talking about the endovascular treatment of these vascular disorders. Hi, everybody present here. I'm Dr. Subrato Nag. I'm consultant intervention radiologist, and I'll be presenting before you uh, the basics of endovascular surgery and cath lab. So what is endo endovascular surgery? It is a form of minimally invasive surgery for imaging the circulation and treating vascular disorders from within the circulation through catheters, miniature instruments inserted percutaneously in the blood vessels. Digital subtraction angiography was thus introduced in 1980 as a method for intravenous injection of contrast for imaging the arterial system as the contrast in the arterial system following intravenous injection was too dilute to be imaged with the standard x-rays. So this is the cath lab in which uh, we see giant screens and a table in which the patient is placed and we use x-rays and detectors to visualize the malformations or the procedures. So first we go into the basic concepts of cerebral angiography. So there has to be a pre-procedure evaluation of the patients. This is done uh, to evaluate the basics of the disease in which a brief neurological examination is performed to establish a baseline should a neurologic procedure change during or after the procedure. The patient should be asked if he or she has any prior history of iodinated contrast reaction allergy. The femoral pulse, the dorsalis pedis pulse, posterior tibial pulses should be examined. Blood workup with serum creatinine level coagulation parameters should be reviewed. Pre-angiogram procedures include NPO for six hours prior to the procedure, placing one peripheral IV line, placing a Foley's catheter if the intervention, uh, if only an intervention is anticipated. So going into the access, we first, uh, we first should talk about sheaths. Sheaths are the hemostatic conduits inserted into the vessels. They allow the passage of the guide wires, catheters, and the interventional devices. Hemostatic valve at the tip and side port is used for the aspiration and the administration of the drugs. This helps to minimize local repeated exchanges as well as decreases blood loss and hematoma formation. These are the sheets which we use commonly. Sheets are usually color coded and we most commonly use sheets are uh, six, seven and eight trenches which are green, orange and blue. Sheets are measured with an inner diameter in French size where one French is equal to 1.33 millimeter. Next, we move on to the catheters, which are used for the angiographic procedures. They consist of guide catheters and diagnostic catheters. Many catheters are su su suitable for uh, cerebral angiography. As a rule, we use a 100 centimeter long catheter that have a curve and allows selection of the vessels from the arch. These are the various catheters which we uh, use day in and day out. And next, uh, we talk about the puncture site. The puncture site is usually the common femoral artery on the medial third of the femoral head, one to two centimeter below the inguinal ligament. The puncture site below the ligament cannot be compressed and should, uh, if it is not uh, compressed, it results in a large pelvic hemorrhage or hematoma formation. So this has to be performed very carefully in the cell danger technique as was uh, described by Swedish radiologist in 1953. The cell danger technique is a method access to the blood vessels. The desired vessel is punctured with a sharp hollow needle called a trocar with ultrasound guidance. Guide wire is then advanced through the lumen of the trocar and a sheath or blunt cannula is then passed over the guide wire into the cavity of the vessel. After passing a sheath or tube, the guide wire is withdrawn. A sheath can be then introduced, a uh, sheath can be then used to introduce catheters or other devices to perform the endoluminal procedures. Fluoroscopy is used to confirm the position of the catheter and to maneuver it to the desired location. Injection of the radio contrast may be used to visualize the organs. Upon completion of the desired procedure, the sheath is withdrawn and a sealing device may be used to close the hole made by the procedure. So this is the uh, technique which we were discussing in details. Here in the step one, we insert the needle and then uh, we slowly withdraw it 
to get it into the lumen where we can see a spurt of blood. And then uh, after the spurt of blood, we insert the guide wire, and then slowly removing the needle, we thread the catheter to the area of interest after removal of the guide wire. So next, we uh, see about how we measure the uh, devices we use. The entry needle is usually measured in bodge. The guide wire is measure, measured in inch and rest, rest of the sheath, guiding catheters and diagnostic catheters are measured in French. So in a nutshell, the needles are measured in bodge, the catheters in French and wires in a thousand of an inch. So, uh, and we commonly call them as O35 or O38 wires. One very important principle to be kept in mind is that there should not be any air inside the injecting uh, uh, while injecting the contrast agent because it can cause air embolism, air embolism and can lead to fatal complications. Anticoagulation is performed with heparin for flushes and ir irrigation. We use a heparinized saline of 1000 units of heparin per liter of saline. Except for pediatric patients less than six years of age, we then use 1000 units of heparin per liter of saline. Systemic anticoagulation is done with a loading dose of IV heparin of 5,000 units or 70 units per kg prior to placement of the guide catheter in the access vessel. Additional heparin is used in the procedure if necessary, 1,000 units IV per hour. Now, what, uh, what do you do about a femoral artery puncture site management? The gold standard for management of the arteriotomy after an angiogram is manual compression. Thus, after removing the sheath, Applying pressure on the groin one to two, two centimeters superior to the skin incision is done. The pressure should be applied for 15 minutes, usually five minutes of occlusive pressure followed by 10 minutes of lesser, lesser pressure. For patients on aspirin or any other anticoagulants, a longer time is required, usually 40 minutes. At the end of the period, we slowly release the pressure on the groin. At the end of the time period, the release of pressure on the groin is done slowly by applying a pressure dressing. After the compression, the patient should remain supine for five hours and then be allowed to ambulate but remain under nursing observation. So moving on to the disorders we treat are aneurysms. So first, we, when a patient comes with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, as you can see here, there is blood in the sylvan fissure and, uh, and around the perimesencephalic mm -hmm. systems. So, CT angio is performed and the digital subtraction angiography finally confirms the aneurysm and the size of the aneurysm and accordingly the treatment can be performed. Here we can see there is a basilar top aneurysm. Again, another CT angiography which shows that there is an IC aneurysm. So aneurysms can uh, be at various locations as we can see in this procedure. The aneurysms can rupture and bleed and it has to be treated and it is a medical emergency. It is, we commonly call aneurysms as ticking time bomb and it should be treated as soon as it is diagnosed. So how, this is how we treat aneurysms. We can see here is an, uh, I say top aneurysm and it is, uh, a coiling has to be performed to occlude the aneurysm. Here we see the coiling in process and slowly the entire aneurysm is occluded with coils and post procedure, uh, there is no filling that can be seen in the aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Next, we, uh, an, this is another CT in which we can see an AV malformation. Here we can see that there is uh, uh, serpiginous vessels seen along the periventricular region and the frontoparietal region, and which is draining into the straight sinus. Angiography has been performed, digital subtraction angiography, which shows supply from the MCA and the draining vein being the straight sinus. So how do we treat this? We treat this by embolization. So this is a graphic representation of the aneurysm. And this is actually an abnormal communication between the artery and vein. And this has to be embolized with embolic agents. Next, the, the, this is a co very common disease which we see day to day. And this is a carotid artery disease in which the patient has presented with an acute stroke. Here we can see that there is increase in MTT and there is a diffusion perfusion mismatch. And uh, CT angiography shows that there is an acute occlusion seen in the ICA. Digital subtraction angiography shows that there is a 90% narrowing seen at the origin of the ICA. 
Accordingly, we put the patient on antiplatelets and then we can uh, use a long sheet and using the long sheet, we can use a wire support, negotiate a stent, pre-dilate it with a balloon and then put a stent and post-dilate it with a balloon. Post procedure, we can see that the patency of the carotid artery has been restored. So this is a graphic representation of how the procedure is, has been performed. So this is the, these are the thrombus, which is uh, layering the wall of the vessel, the origin of the vessel. So here we are taking in a carotid stent, we are putting the stent, we are post dilating with a balloon and the lumen can be restored. Vesospasm is another common complication which follows subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is mostly aneurysm, uh, aneurysmal. Uh, here we can see that uh, there is uh, acute narrowing seen in the MCA M1 segment. This is uh, post bleed uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So here we can see that here here is the aneurysm, and the aneurysm has been coiled, and uh, the vessel spasm has been later on treated, and the vessel patency has been restored. So these are the normal. Uh, vessels and this is an aneurysm when it ruptures it can re result in vasospasm which results from various uh, metabolites which are endothelin 1 and uh, lipid production neuroinflammation uh, these result in arterial narrowing and restriction of blood flow in the circulation acute ischemic cva is another uh, emergency uh, here we can see that there is an acute infarct in the left MCA territory. And digital subtraction angiography uh, performed shows that there is narrowing seen and there is no distal, uh, distal flow in the MCA or in the AC. So the uh, stroke thrombectomy has been performed. So this is a balloon guiding catheter and there is a, a micro catheter which we have taken. And through that, the strength, uh, the strength retriever has been taken. And with this, we try to uh, take out the clot and the clot gets tra trapped inside the strength retriever, which can be retrieved back and taken back into the long sheet. And accordingly, you can see the post procedure, the blood flow to the distal vessels has been beautifully restored. So this is a representation of how this, this was blocked and how a thrombus was there and blood clot which was retrieved by the strength retriever. Besides the neural interventions, uh, we can also, uh, there is a vast area of peripheral interventions which we uh, regularly perform. So this is a plain balloon angioplasty in which the peripheral vessels, usually the lower limb vessels, they get occluded with plaques and cause acute narrowing and critical limb ischemia. So often we can perform drug coated balloon angioplasty in which we uh, can, uh, um, the vessel uh, patency can be restored. Sometimes bare metal strength, strength placement can be done or drug eluting strength placement can also be done, which restores the vessel, vessel patency. Bronchial artery embolization is also a very important uh, endovascular procedure, which usually uh, follows uh, due to complications like uh, complications of tuberculosis and bronchiectasis. So here we can see there is a hypervascular lesion with aneurysm, aneurysm formation. There's a pre-embolization uh, image in which we can see there is a the vascular blush seen over here pre-embolization and embolization has been performed with PFA particles and post-embolization, the blast, blush has completely reduced. There is no hypervascular lesion or aneurysm. The, the, there are uh, scopes of renal intervention as well. Here we can see that there is, an, uh, there is a hypervascular lesion, which is a hyponephroma seen in the upper pole of the left kidney. Here we can see that there is a deep vascular blush over here and post embolization, this blush has completely reduced with uh, good flow in the lower part of the, of the renal arteries, interlobar and the segmental arteries. We can, uh, this is a, this is a uh, novel procedure which is regularly being performed for hepatocellular tumors. This is transarterial chemoembolization of tumors. Here we can see there, they, this is a, 
uh, lesion which is seen in the right lobe of the liver. Another lesion is there in the left lobe. And we can perform a selective angiography to find out the vascular blush. And this is the vascular blush of the lesion. And we can use chemotherapeutic or the radiotherapeutic agents to embolize uh, uh, the, uh, these tumors and which can also uh, cause uh, recurrence and uh, uh, de de decrease the disease load. Post-traumatic pseudoaneurysms can also be procedures here you can see a post-traumatic pseudoaneurysm which is formed and endovascular and the vascular blush has been reduced by uh, occluding a super selective angiographic procedure being done then the lesion being occluded with coils. This is, these are some of the other cases like uh, treatment of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma in which uh, we have performed super selective uh, uh, catheterization and we have found that there is vascular blush from the external carotid artery branches, namely the middle meningeal artery, accessory meningeal artery and mild vascular blush from the internal carotid artery. So after this, we have performed uh, super selective embolization of the external carotid artery branches and there is, has been a lot reduction in the vascularity of the nasopharyngeal and fibroma. Here, this is a case, here we can see there is a uh, brachial artery hypervascular tumor, which is uh, which is taking a lot of vascular blush from the brachial artery. Here we perform uh, super selective embolization with um, coils and with some PVA particles, thereby reducing the vascular blush. Another very uh, common uh, common illness uh, we commonly see is varicose veins. Here we can see that there are dilated tortuous veins in the legs, which is uh, which results due to long standing and continuous activity. And here uh, we perform the laser ablation or radio frequency ablation of the varicose veins by using ultrasound and uh, cath lab guidance, and we can ablate the tortuous superficial vessels and ablate the perforators so that uh, later on the skin changes and uh, morbidity gets reduced. Another scope is in uh, treating uh, tumors, some, uh, some, uh, some of the pelvic tumors like fibroids. Here you can see this is the uterus, this is the graphic representation. You can see there are fibroids in the uterus and uh, we have performed super selective emboli, super selective catheterization of the uterine artery. And after the catheter is placed, we can uh, uh, use dye to visualize the regions of the vascular blush or the regions of the fibroid. And then we can embolize them with embolic agents, uh, which can be PFA particles or it can be glue. Post embolization, these fibroids shrink and they result in uh, remission of the symptoms. Uh, we can perform stenting of the iliac arteries or as well. Sometimes uh, there is narrowing seen in the iliac arteries or the femoral arteries. So this is a procedure uh, which shows that there is a stent being placed in a narrowed left femoral artery. Renal artery stenting can also be performed in cases of renal artery stenosis. Vertebroplasty is also commonly performed in osteoporotic patients, old patients uh, who complain of severe backache. So the, the, this is a, a particular plasty procedure uh, being performed in which bone cement is in, uh, introduced into the vertebral bodies and which results in uh, decrease in joint pain and strengthening of the vertebral bodies. The, uh, commonly performed procedures in the radiology department uh, consist of a percutaneous biopsy. Here we see that we are taking biopsy from uh, some superficial uh, lesions uh, which are metastatic. Biopsies can also be performed uh, with CT guidance and also uh, cath lab guidance from the uh, liver as well as from the lungs. So concluding, uh, my basic introduction about the procedures being performed in intervention radiology. Uh, I would li just like to stress that while performing procedure, we have to keep in mind regarding three things. First is time, less time spent near the source is less radiation received. And we have to maintain a greater distance, greater the distance from the source, there is less radiation received. And there should be adequate shielding uh, with lead aprons and 
uh, adequate sh shielding using uh, proper uh, radiation protective devices. The uh, to conclude, I would uh, like to mention some of the complications which should, should always be kept in mind, like systemic access site complications and catheter related complications. There can be contrast induced nephropathy, which increases with age and increases with uh, creatinine if there are comorbidities like heart failure, diabetes mellitus, pre procedure hypotension, anemia, ionic contrast medium reactions, if there is improper hydration, and thus a minimum contra contrast dose has to be maintained. Access site complications are the most common, hematoma formation, thrombosis, bleeding, AV, AV malformation, and then pseudoaneurysm formation, hematoma after re reversal of the anticoagulation has to be kept in mind. And catheter related complications are due to dissection, distal embolization and perforation. While performing procedures, we have to always keep, keep in mind about these complications and uh, thus the procedures will be well performed there. Thank you for your uh, time and uh, providing me an opportunity to speak. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shubhrata, for a very a nice overview of all the procedures which are possible on, in the CAT lab. And if there are any questions, uh, the participants are either requested to put it up in the chat box or to unmute yourself and put your question forward. Hey, uh, Hello, madam. Uh, thank you, Kubalo uh, uh, Madam, may I request uh, Bibu Kollani, madam, to kindly uh, share a few words of her experience because she has been blind for so long. Would she like to give any uh, add anything to what uh, as far as whatever we have had this discussion? Only I want to say something to Subrato that uh, what is the part of uh, neuroanesthetics they play at your cath lab? You should have, what are the things they are, they looked after so that you do the procedure in a very nice way. So that is one thing. Another is uh, what they have said uh, during the, um, what Orgo said, Orgo, that oh, what are the things? It is uh, often uh, there might be pneumothorax while doing cal um, uh, placing your uh, intravenous uh, central venous catheter, um, not the jugular one, the brachiocephalic one. So in that case, we may land up with, and we have also registered those things. And um, um, those are the things. Uh, while uh, doing the embolization or um, coiling, in those cases, to take care of the patient, the hemodynamic status, and while the patient should be still, and also there will be the um, your heparinization and protaminization, all these things are uh, to be done by the anesthetist only. So that, those are the things I have to highlight. Anything you say, you have also good experience in uh, handling these cases at cath labs and it, it, during it, MRI, MRI anesthesia in the um, MRI. They are also, we are involved to give anesthesia the MRI soon. So those are the things where we are involved. That is the one thing. Thank you, madam. Hmm. So if uh, uh, Rajeshri, madam, would you like to add anything? Uh, Charita, are you talking to me? Uh, unfortunately, yes, my camera in this laptop is not working. 
but thank you very much for a wonderful speakers and all of them gave us very good knowledge i mean quite a lot of knowledge with not only taking care of the basics so thank you again for this wonderful workshop and i'm glad that i uh, registered for this workshop thank you thank you madam thank you for your encouragement so i think with that uh, we come to the end of the session and we will meet again in hall b for the next session thank you and thank you dr mona for conducting the workshop thank you so much to you and all your colleagues for giving us this wonderful experience thank you and a big thank you for mona and the team they have mm, done chicken. very well they Thanks, have done. Um, we are all we very happy to be a part of, of this endeavor thank you you have put in a lot of effort to give us an overview thank you so much i would also like to congratulate you for uh, introducing this workshop dr bibu dr sucharita and team and we hope to continue having such a workshop in uh, other conferences we will uh, benefit a lot and we interact with all the neurosciences departments thank you very much pleasure. thank you madam pleasure being here today thank you so much thank you so much for your kind words madam thank you okay so that brings us to the end of the session